Hello everybody, Carl Schuh, back with the Timeline Light Ultimate Starter Guide on Active Touch Plus. In part four, we're going to be talking about working with labels. In previous exercises, we've talked about controlling Timeline Light by telling it to reverse or pause or restart. But today, we're going to be adding labels so that we can navigate to specific sections of a timeline and also play specific segments of a timeline light. We'll be doing a little study on nonlinear navigation. So in the Swift that I see here, I can go from the library section, which is the last, to the align section, back to color, over to library. And we're also going to have a next button that's going to allow us to go through each section in sequence. Since library is the last section, I'm going to show you how to loop back to the beginning to color. And then we can click through to all the different sections. Along the way, I'm going to be showing you some other tips and tricks. They're going to be very helpful in your timeline light future. So let's dive in. In Flash, I want to show you the basic FLA setup and just get that out of the way. Really, all we have are a series of panels. We have these movie clips where we have a line and it has the actual image of the panel, the head text. There's some body text here. It's hard to see gray on gray. And all of them are set up so that they're ready just to tween onto the stage to the right coordinates. So all the buttons have good instance names like library underscore button. And this symbol here is called color underscore MC. It's all going to make a lot of sense. Feel free to dive through this FLA when you get it from the downloads section. In my action script file, I'm doing stuff very standard to what I've been doing before. We have our necessary imports. Um, we're declaring a few public variables for our stage instances. Here I have end x and end y, which are just the coordinates of where all the movie clips are going to end up after their animation. I also have in this file my typical create timeline method, where we're just going to be able to focus on all the code needed to create that animation. And here I just have a series of tween maxes appended to my timeline light. And they're just going to run in sequence. For each section I have commented out, there's really just very basic tweens happening here. We're sliding on a movie clip, and then it's fading out. Sliding in a movie clip, and then it's fading out. When we get down to library, it's a little bit more robust. I'm showing you that we can individually tween each item inside of that clip. So let's just see how this file runs right out of the box, okay? Just the animation. You'll see each panel comes in, fades away, and then the next one does its build sequence. When we get to the end, the timeline just stops. Now let's say that I really want to tweak that last section with all those tweens, the library panel. Well, I don't want to have to wait for this animation to keep playing every time I want to see if changing 0.2 seconds to 0.5 seconds for a tween makes any difference. So this is where labels are going to come in, and this is a huge time-saving tip right here. What I can do is add a label right before all the library tweens happen, and then I can go to and play that label just like I would in a normal timeline in Flash. In fact, I have old school open over here, and you'll see exactly what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be having labels set up so I can go to and play a label, which will actually mean play the sequence, and then we're going to go to literally a frame that's going to stop that sequence. And so, in my example, I want to be able to bypass home. I'm going to jump right to the about label and play and then hopefully stop. So in my action script file here, right before the library starts, I'm going to add a label. Now the method name for this, take a guess, is add label. All right, isn't that just the best? So here, add label needs a string and a time. Well, the string is just the name of the label that I want to use. So I'm going to call it library. And now the time is what point in time should this label be added? Now, this could be tricky. Technically, I need to figure out how long it's taken to get to this point in time in the timeline. Now, I could go ahead and add up all the durations and delays of all the tweens prior, but that's going to be a big pain in the neck. What we can do is go back to our previous knowledge of timeline light and realize, ah, the duration property tells me the duration of a timeline light. So as this timeline light is being constructed, as new tweens are added, the duration is always increasing. And at this point in time, before these tweens are added, all I need to do is plug into that duration. So I'm going to say tl.duration. 
And just to show you what that duration value is, I could also trace it out real quick. I'm going to say let's trace out the duration here. And just so you can see that it's going to change right after the color tweens are done, I'm going to trace it out there as well. So I'm going to get two traces hopefully when I test this out. And if I bring my output panel over, you'll see that the first trace is 1.2 and the second one is 3.6. So that first one, we can do the math on that because we have a tween that's one second long and then one that's 0.2 long. So at this point in time, the duration is 1.2 seconds. Well, thankfully, we don't have to add all these up. Once we get to this point in time here, before we add these tweens, we can access the duration again. So now that that label is there, it's very easy. Once the timeline is built, we know it's going to play automatically, but I can say go to end play, just like I would with a movie clip. And just like a movie clip, I need to put the name of it in there. So I'm going to say tl.go to and play library. Okay. And let's see how this works. And there you go. You'll see I jumped directly to the library section. Now, let's just say that I wanted to see that section play over and over again, because right now I'm like, oh, it happened kind of fast. What's going on here? Well, you want to see some more trickery. I can, in my constructor here, I can say, you know what? Let's put an on complete here, and I'm going to create a function called play again. And play again is going to go back to the library section. So this is pretty cool. In my play again, I'm going to say tl.go to end play library. So here I've created a little loop inside of my timeline link. It's going to play, and then we're going to see it over and over again. So now I could really analyze the timing, I could shift some things around, and I'm not going to do that right now. But hopefully you can see the power of adding labels for even just simple debugging. Now for more practical reasons, what I want to do is have each of those buttons on the bottom take me to the appropriate section. Let me give myself some room here. And now I'm going to need to add labels before every section in my timeline life. Now I know some of you guys sort of harsh on the Flash Pro IDE for doing action script editing, but I want you to check this out. Computer, add labels to the appropriate section. Voila! Check that out. So now you'll see that we're adding the color label, the align label, and the transform label, all based on the duration at that point in time. Now in order to make the buttons work, we're going to have to tell each button to go to the appropriate label. And I have a really efficient method that I'm going to show you so that each button can very easily go to its respective label in the timeline. If we take a look at my FLA real quick, I want to point out that each one of these buttons are button components and they each have label properties. So each button, when I click on it, we're going to say, okay, figure out the label of the button that I clicked and then tell the timeline light to go to that respective label in the timeline. So back in my basic labels.as, before I move forward, I'm going to get rid of that whole loop that we have of the library animation. So I'm going to get rid of that first go to and play library, and my play again function is not going to have anything in it. Now each button here calls in nav click handler. So color, align, transform, and library button all call the nav click handler. So let's go to nav click handler. and Inside of here, I want to figure out what is the label of the button that I just clicked. So let's just start with a trace. And I'm going to access the event that was called, and I'm going to get the target of that event, and I'm going to look for that target's label. So check this out. When I test this out, if I click on align, it tells me align. If I click on library, I get library. If I click on color, you get the idea. So I have a really clever way of figuring out exactly which button I clicked. So I'm just going to copy that out and I'm going to tell my TL to go to end play e.target.label. 
it's a lot easier than creating an align click handler, a transform click handler, or click handler for each individual button. So just by adding that one little line of code there, you will see that now I can go to align, I can go to library, I can go to color, I can go to transform at any point in time. But what you might see is that the timeline is getting away from me. And with all things in Flash, when you add one piece of functionality, you usually break something else. So now I'm at the end of my timeline, and if I click on color, yes, I go to color, but the whole timeline goes out of control. And now we're getting back to that point that I mentioned earlier in my old school FLA, where after each section plays, we have a stop action. And that's my output panel. So let me just show you that we have a stop action there. And after the about section, we'd have a stop. So that's the old school method. Now in Timeline Lite, we're going to do something very similar. After each sequence plays, I'm going to tell my Timeline Lite to stop. So we're going to go through, and once the color animation plays, when that tween is finished, we want to tell the timeline to stop. But since you guys played attention so well in the first few exercises, you know there is no stop method. But I'm going to put an on complete callback in here that's going to tell my timeline light to call its what? Yes, pause method. Now here, you are going to be intuitively possibly prompted to put in the parenthesis there, not a zero. And this is a mistake. And I want to point out that this is not going to work correctly because whenever you call a function and put the parenthesis after it, you're invoking that function to run immediately. So now notice that you're not going to see any animation. The timeline light is just paused from the get-go. And that's exactly how my stage looks in my FLA. It's just that one slide sitting there. So you don't want to put the parenthesis here. What you want to do is just simply pass a reference to the timeline light's pause function. So when this tween max here completes, it's going to say, hey, Mr. Timeline, I want you to pause. So the proper behavior that we want is this. We see the animation, and then it pauses. Now we're also going to have to add this to the rest of my initial tweens. So I'm going to copy that. And I don't have a voice command for this one, I'm sorry. Um, it's a limited feature. So here on complete, we're going to pause, and then after the end Y for the transform, on complete, tell the timeline to pause. And in the library section, this is the last tween, the body text comes in, and we're going to tell it to pause. So now we're going to jump to a label, we're going to play all the tweens, and then the timeline is going to pause. So here, it's really cool. We have these little stop points now put in. It's just like putting a stop on a frame. If I go to transform, we jump to the transform label, we play the animation, and then it stops. If I go to library, same thing. I can go to align, and now I have my nonlinear navigation. Pretty cool, right? Let's take a look at another method for adding labels. And this is going to come in really handy. Now that you understand how labels work, let's jump over to our friend, the Timeline Light documentation. And you'll see here we have the insert method, which we've used before, okay? And we know that insert will put a tween at a specific point in time in our timeline. And it can also insert a tween at a label. If you insert at a label that doesn't exist yet, that's the important part, it will automatically place that label at the end of the timeline and then insert the tween timeline. So what does that mean? Well. In my example here, I've been using append over and over again because it just puts it one after the other and it works great. But instead of using the add label method, I could have instead said, let's insert this tween, and this is super cool. And I want to insert it instead of at a specific time, I'm going to say, add it at the frame labeled library. Well, since library does not exist, it's automatically going to go there. So we have two methods. You can use the add label method, or you can use the insert method, and then just crank the uh, label onto the end there. And let me just test this and verify that it's going to work just the same as other labels. 
it's going to go to library and it knows exactly what to do. Go to align with add label, works fine, library, insert with the label parameter added at the end. So write that down in your notebook. Cool? All right. The next thing we're going to do is hook up that next button. So let's go over here and we have something called next click handler. And this is going to be really easy. And just so you know, my next button is going to call the next click handler because we get into this position now where our timeline plays and then it pauses. If I want to go to the next section, what do I need to do? Well, I want the timeline just to continue playing. So I'm going to close the Swift and I'm just going to go down to where my next click handler is and I'm going to say tl.play. And that's all it is because once the timeline stops, hitting play is going to tell it to play again. So I hit next, fades out, the next one comes in. Hit next, a line will fade out, the next one comes in. And so that was fairly simple. Now I know you're thinking, cool, you got everything working, it's done. Uh-uh. This is epic, guys. This is Return of the King. You think it's over, but there's like three more endings. And right now, we got some more stuff we got to wrap up. Because if I'm on the library section and I hit next, yes, the timeline's going to play, but wah, wah, it doesn't go back to the beginning and we're stuck looking at this black screen here. So the issue here is that we hit this last pause in the, in the library section and then we fade out and that's the end. Well, remember earlier we put this play again on complete callback into our timeline light. So that method is still floating around down here. And if I want to play the timeline again, what do I do? That's right, I want it to restart. I'm glad you guys watched that first three episodes. So restart is the method that will call to bring the playhead back to the beginning and play. So now if I save and test, I'll jump right to library. And now when I hit next, there we go back to the beginning so I can click all the way through. In this next section folks I'm going to be talking about some of the additional properties and methods that Timeline Max gives us for accessing label data and doing some more interesting tweens. So here in the Timeline Max documentation I'm seeing all the properties right now of Timeline Max and Timeline Lite. And a real handy feature of AS Docs is that if I hit hide inherited public properties I'm only going to see the new properties that Timeline Max brings to the table. And I'm going to be talking about the current label property, which gives us the label closest to the current position of the playhead in the timeline. And this will allow us to dynamically figure out what label we're closest to. Um, in the public methods, let's uh, hide the inherited ones. And we're going to be talking about get label after, which will allow us to figure out what's the next label. and Get label before works just like it, but I won't be showing that. And we also have tween2, which allows us to have the timeline play from the current position to a specific label or time. So I'm going to jump back into my code, and before I do anything, I need to upgrade my timeline light to a timeline max. I don't need to import anything differently. I'm just going to go down here to where now my timeline constructor is, and I need to say I'm making a new timeline max. So once I've done that, I now have access to current label, get label after, and tween two. Now, the first thing I want to do is show you how we can use current label. And in this first tween here, I have an on start callback that's going to be calling the method called update current section. So as soon as this first tween runs, I'm going to call update current section. And I already wrote out the uh, method here and I'm just going to do a trace tl dot current label okay so if I save this and give it a whirl you'll see that color comes in first and you'll see the trace is color so it's telling me what section I'm in so this is pretty cool based on where the timeline is I can tell what section I'm in and I'm just going to very quickly take that on start and we're going to just copy it and I'm not going to do my voice command again so paste and paste and now 
for this first tween in the library, since it has a zero duration, it doesn't really have a start and an end. So I'm going to tack this on start to the next tween that happens here. And I don't need that additional comma. We'll save. And then now, if I go to transform, notice that transform comes up. When I go to library, I go to library. Now what you may have thought to do is say, oh, well, how about when I press the align button, I'll just have the align button dictate to my app what section I'm in. Well, the problem with that is when you hit the next button, then that event wouldn't trigger. So by having this glued into the timeline, it works really well. So if I hit next, it tells me color. If I'm in color and I go to align, it tells me align. So I could easily have, you know, a tooltip or I could do something much more dynamic. Maybe when I go to another section, a window could pop up and says, you know, do you want to close the transform section? Something like that. So by accessing current label, I always know where I am. I don't have to hard code it into a whole bunch of buttons. Whenever the live the timeline plays through this tween, it's I can update that value. Right now I'm not storing that value anywhere. I'm just tracing it out to you. And something else that might be interesting to add to our little app, maybe when you click the next button, maybe you get a little tooltip that tells you what the next section is. And we can dynamically generate that value using the get label after method. So for my next button, if we scroll up in my code, I've already added a rollover handler for it, and we're going to call next over handler on the next button when I roll over it and scrolling down, I've already put it in there. And so whenever I roll over the next button, right now I'm just going to do a trace. I'm not going to build in crazy tooltip functionality, but I'm going to trace out tl.get, or I'll make it more verbose, I'm going to say next section is plus tl.get label after. And I want to point out that get label after can optionally take in a time. So if I want to know what's the label after the halfway point in the timeline, I would put in 0.5 here. If I don't pass in any value, it's just going to assume the label after the current position of the playhead. And we don't want a semicolon there. I want to close my trace. And now this is going to be pretty cool. So I've added this one line of code. And now whenever I roll over the next button, it says the next section is aligned. And it would really help if you saw my output panel there. Let's go to the transform section. Roll over the next button, and it's telling me, oh, the next section or label is library. Now, when I roll over, when I go to library, what's the label after library? Well, there isn't any. So when I roll over next, note that I'm going to get next section is null. And honestly, when I first started building this tutorial out, I sort of hit a brick wall and Jack of Greensock helped me out here. And it goes back to the fact that we can pass in a time parameter to the get label after method. So I really want to get the first label, okay? And what does the first label come after? Well, negative one or negative any number, okay? So I'm saying, hey, you know what? Go back to a time before zero in my timeline and get me the next label. And that one little trick there solves that problem. So if I'm at the end of the timeline, that's now going to give me color. We're going to have to put this into a conditional, but let me just show you really quick. Let's jump to library or anywhere. If I go to next, it's going to say the next section is color. That's the first label. So I need to make this statement here a little bit more verbose. I could say if get label after is null, then what I'll do is say trace next section is plus, and I'm going to say tl.get label after, and here we're going to pass in minus one, because if it's null, it means that we're at the last one, and then or else can do this. And now instead of writing this out twice, I could have created a little variable to store that value in, but we'll just do this. Okay? It's a little bit longhand, but it's cool.
And before I test this out, I just realized that this should be, I'm sorry, TL dot get label after. And now I roll over next and it gives me a line. Okay. If I go to library, roll over next, it lets me know that it is color. So it went back to the beginning. It went to a time of negative one and gave me the next label after that. So very cool things you can do here. For the next example, I'm going to jump into another file to show you where tween2 really shines. All right, folks, in this last file, I'm going to show you to illustrate how tween2 works. What we have set up is this character here called Fred, and he's literally going to tween to the X and Y positions of these little dots here. These things are called movie pause MC. Here we have work pause for work position, and we just have one, two, three tweens set up that takes Fred from one dot to the next dot. And when I test this movie out, those dots are going to be invisible. And let's say that the timeline plays through, and then when I click on work, I want Fred to move from where he is at movies to work, or even back to home and follow his path all the way back. So what I'm going to do is just jump into this code here, and I'm using a Timeline Max because Tween2 is only available in Timeline Max. And I want to show you a little bit different thing about this file as compared to the other one, and that is the labels that I'm putting are after the tweens for that section. So Home doesn't really have its own tween. That's just where he starts. And then we're appending a tween max. We're taking Fred, and we're bringing him to the school pause MC's X and school pause MC's Y position. And then we have the school label after that. So if he's at home and I tell him to go to school, he's going to play through this tween. Next, we're pending a tween where he's going to go to the work position and then the movies position. So just to show you exactly how tween two can work, I'm going to, on the go home button for the go home handler, I'm just going to say, tell my tween light to tween two, and I'm going to pass in a label, and it's just going to be home. So now, if I test it out, the timeline plays, I click on home, and Fred goes home, and he bypasses, or I'm sorry, he passes through all those positions that he went through in the initial timeline. And I'm just going to do a very quick copy and paste. Once you understand how that timeline is built, we can just say in the school that we're going to tween to school. Now it's important to understand that this is different than anything you can do with a movie clip. The movie clip object doesn't have a play to method, uh, but Timeline Max gives us this extra functionality here. So I'm going to say tween to work, and the last one here, we're just going to do home. Sorry, movies. Test. And then now the timeline plays. I go to home, he goes all the way back through, I can go to work, and I can go to school. And while it's animating, if I'm going to home, click movies real quick, or home, you can catch it at any point in time. Go to movies, go to home, whoops, it'll always reverse. So it's just another little trick that you can have in your timeline max bag of tricks. It's awesome. So folks, those are all the examples that I'm going to show you. And before I let you go, I do want to show you one thing that I want to fix in my file that I've been using up until this point. All right, folks, the small issue I want to point out is that when this Swift first runs, you sometimes see the color MC on the middle of the stage before the first tween begins. Now, it's very difficult to capture on the video, but maybe you'll see a quick blink there. And also the fact that the Flash Player garbage collection kicks in as soon as you know that tween is running, you sometimes get a little distracting jitter. But there's a quick flash there. And in order to accentuate this problem, what I'm going to do is put a delay on the timeline. So this timeline technically shouldn't start for one second. And what's going to happen is this. Let's check this out. Now you'll see that Color MC is sitting there on the stage before that tween starts. Now the reason we're seeing it is because in my FLA, it's actually on the stage. And my first tween in the timeline is a from to tween, which is saying tween it from a position of 600 pixels to the right to a position of 10 pixels from the left of the stage here. So the reason we're seeing this behavior is because all tweens will 
begin on the frame immediately after they are created. So I literally had one frame in there before this object got shifted to the 600 starting point. Now there's a nice property built into tween max and tween light called immediate render. And what we can do is override that default behavior. And I'm going to say immediate render equals true, which means it's not going to wait for the second frame to move this object 600 pixels to the right before it tweens it to its end value. So by putting that in there, you will see now that I don't see that color MC and it's immediately rendered 600 pixels off the stage. So I'm not seeing it. And then it gets introduced nice and smooth. Now I really don't need this delay in here. So I'm just going to get rid of it. And now you may or may not notice a difference, but we've made our file more bulletproof. Okay. So keep immediate render in your back pocket for the future. It comes in handy with from tweens and also tweens of a zero duration. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this lesson. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. The next video is going to be talking about advanced sequencing. And we're going to show you how to literally animate hundreds of things with a very few lines of code. So open up these files, poke around, try to build your own little timeline lights, and be ready for the next one because we're going to take it to the next level. Catch you then.